Hello and welcome to this video. My name's Will and this is the start of my little introduction to JavaScript and to computational thinking and I've called this one commands and functions. And the first thing to say about video is there are more interesting things to look at than my face. So the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to pop back across into OBS, my recording soft the recording software I use, and I'm going to turn off my webcam. There we go. Now I can take sips of cocoa or tea and no one will be any the wiser. All right. Now, as we start learning a programming language, the first thing to say is, well, in a sense, computers are kind of stupid. Um, when we talk to each other, we can be vague and ambiguous in all sorts of different ways. Uh, we understand um, if we say Polly put the kettle on, that we mean kind of a different kind of putting on than if we say Polly put a jumper on. And yes, I have done that dad joke with my kids many times where they say, Dad, can you put the kettle on? Oh, I don't think it would fit. Um, the programming languages that we're going to learn, they're not like that. Uh, I mean, we can now actually talk to a lot of our devices in human languages somewhat. So we can go, OK, Google, tell me a joke. Here's a good one. What does a frog do if his car breaks down? He gets it towed away. But that's not the sort of programming language we're going to be talking about. We're going to be talking about the ones like JavaScript, where we end up needing to be very precise. And if we put as much as a curly bracket in the wrong place, mismatched parentheses, suddenly the computer kind of can't parse what we're saying and it's going to um, give us a syntax error. Um, these are languages that um, are, well, they're harder for us. We talk into the computer's language a bit more. And it's partly because the computer's doing a bit less. When I asked uh, my little device to go tell me a joke, well, it sent the sound file off into the cloud or wherever. And it, it did lots of artificial intelligence processing and uh, before it knew what I said. Uh, we want your compiler, the programs you, you uh, write to be able to be things that you write on your computer here and now. And so that might be a little bit different. OK, enough on that. Let's get on to uh, the actual programming languages. Uh, so the one that we're going to use for this is called JavaScript. Uh, it's also called ECMA script uh, or ES. Um, the reason is that JavaScript started out originally as a, as, as a brand name uh, for the language. And then when it was standardized, uh, it became standardized as ECMA script. But so the, the two terms are... <laughs> loosely interchangeable now. JavaScript, ECMA script, uh, you occasionally hear them talked about as things like ES 2016 uh, as particular versions of JavaScript. Like many of the programming languages that you will come across, it is an imperative language. That means it's about giving instructions for a machine to follow. You can tell it to do something, change something, then change something else, and it generally follows those instructions in order. Uh, so we're going to start introducing this using a little robot game. So let's meet our cast of characters. Uh, so this is Welcome to the Lava Maze. Uh, we're not going to meet all of them in this video. We're going to meet a few more of them in the exercise. Uh, but I wanted to show you that there's going to be a few more of them because actually the ones that you'll meet in the exercise, there's comparatively few. There's going to be Snowbot. Uh, this is our little robot that we're going to command to go around the maze. And he can uh, he can trundle across floor tiles. Uh, he shouldn't trundle into lava tiles. And he is trying to reach a goal which will teleport him uh, away or off to the next level, etc. Um, but there's some other things that we'll introduce in the exercises, tutorials, assignments, etc. Um, OK, so first thing to say, if we are going to write a program, if we're going to be writing this text that the JavaScript interpreter is going to understand, well, there's kind of a couple of bits of it. We, we need the vocabulary, the things that we can say, the words, the tokens. Um, and then we also need the syntax, how we compose those things together in a way that the interpreter can parse. Now, some of the terms that we'll come across are what languages call reserved words. They're part of the language itself. So an if statement means if. We can't redefine if to be anything else. It means if. Um, let and while. Some of these other, other ones are programming language reserved words. Typically, there's not a lot of reserved words in programming languages. There's, you know, a couple of dozen or so, um, as opposed to English that has, you know, thousands upon thousands uh, of, of words that we use. Um, 
there's then often another set of um, words that get introduced by the libraries. Uh, so uh, these are bits of program that have been written in the language but are supplied with it. So um, there is a, a, a library called Math. So you can say I want a I, you know I want a random number Math dot random uh, or or something like this. And those are things that are there's standard things that are supplied, but they're not quite part of the language definition itself. Some of them are things that are defined by the environment that we're running the program in. Now, one of these, uh, and I'm going to immediately do one of these dodgy things where I actually just go right click. And actually, let's go Control Shift I. And so this is going to open the developer tools in Chrome. And you'll see some errors that don't, don't worry too much about those particular errors at the moment. Um, but this thing here, this is a little console um, that can do things and that I can log to it. So I can say console.log of hello uh, and it will print out the uninspiring text hello. Uh, but so this is part of the environment that we're working in uh, rather than um, being um, a particular math library or something like this. This is because I'm because I'm running it in the browser. I've got access to this and some of them are defined by other parts of our program. So uh, there might be functions that you define, uh, or there might also be some that the little games that I'm going to going to supply uh, for you to do your coding in are going to supply. So within the lava maze, we can tell Snowbot to go right by saying right. Now I'm just going to shrink that down, and unfortunately it's going to skip back to the beginning. Sorry, that's a little bug that I'll fix later on, um, and head back to where we were. So once we've got these words. We're going to need syntax, how we can put them together in ways that the JavaScript language can interpret. That is enough talking to bullet points for the moment. Let us come across. And so here we have uh, Snowbot sitting in a particularly unspectacular uh, lava maze. This is not the world's hardest maze to solve. He just has to go right twice, uh, as we can see. But it lets me start off by showing the idea of giving commands and also show a little coding environment. So the way I've got these set up, um, there's a couple of modes. We can do this using tiles. Uh, so I can go and click, I would like to tell Snowbot to go right, and a right tile will appear. And I can drop that into my program up here. And if I was to reset the program and run it, Snowbot would go right one square. You know, we didn't quite make it to the goal, uh, but now that's programmed completed undefined. And so it's logging some stuff down here. Um, to this other little area that I can use print and hello. Though actually from my program, I could also do console.log hello. Um, all right, let's reset that and let's clear this text output uh, for a moment. Um, now, if I wanted to take that out of uh, the program, I'd just hold it down for a second and I can drag that away and I can throw that in the trash if I want to. Okay, so this is going to let me uh, write programs uh, in a way that will look like text, but by dragging them together um, using these uh, using these scatterable tiles. Uh, so if I wanted to do write twice, well, let's drop a write in. And in this case, I can drop another write just underneath. You can see that little orange highlight turn up. And now if I ran that, it goes right once, goes right twice, teleports away, it succeeds. Okay. Um, I could also, if I wanted, flip this over into text mode. And so this now I have a just a little JavaScript area that I can type my code in. And you can see that I can type write, write a bit like I, I showed beforehand. And if I run that, sure enough, goes right, goes right, teleports away, all works, no problems. Uh, you'll notice there's a little I here, missing semicolon. So in JavaScript statements, things you want the program to do end with a semicolon. So if I put those semicolons in, those little eyes will go away. The program will still behave the same. Um, this is because JavaScript uh, does uh, automatic uh, semicolon inference. Uh, so if I miss the semicolons, it will try and work out where I wanted to put the semicolons. And it tends to think things like the ends of lines are good places to put semicolons. Um, but sometimes it can't quite work it out. So if I was to do that, uh, and so instead, if I was to run it just with those straight after each other, I get syntax error, unknown, unexpected token. Nope, it couldn't work out what I meant. Just putting them like that didn't work. If I go and stick the semicolon in there, though, uh, then it's happy. OK, next thing to say about this. I have 
got this command. We've got, you know, a term. This is the name of the function that I want to call. The function is called write, and it makes Nobot go write one square. Uh, but we can see that because this is a function when I'm calling it in JavaScript, uh, I need these parentheses afterwards. If I just went write, write like that, um, well, it would behave a bit strangely. It says completed undefined and it didn't do anything. So I, I, I happened to refer to this function called write, but I didn't call it. To call it, say, no, no, do write, that, that, that write. I want you to call that function. I need the parentheses. Uh, and so then that will now work again. OK, so far, hopefully so good. Let, let's keep going. So um, these are some notes uh, here. So some of these slides, uh, I'm aware that people don't just watch videos. They also sometimes click through slides and then they pop back to, to and from between the slides and the videos. Uh, so I've put some notes in here for if you're clicking through and reading along as you go or reading along instead of watching the video or as well. Um, but so some of the things, you know, we, we've got to call a function in JavaScript, put the name of the function followed by any arguments it takes in parentheses. We will see about um, function arguments shortly. Uh, but so if it doesn't take any arguments, then to call it, we end up with the name of the function followed by an empty set of parentheses. Statements ended with a semicolon, but if you miss it out, JavaScript will try and infer where you meant to put it. And those two statements are executed one after another. So this is because it's an imperative language. These commands executed one after each other. Um, to show you what I mean, let's go right and let's go up. And he's going to go right and then he's going to plunge off into the lava. Oh, dear. Um, but so it did the right first and then it did the up. OK. Let's keep going. Making decisions. Now, this particular uh, maze has been set up so that if I reset it, oh, it changed. It went straight instead of turning down. Uh, let's reset it again. No, this time it's going down instead of straight ahead. So this time I can't um, just say, and I'm going to just pop to the, the, the um, text version for this. Uh, I, if I was just to say, right, right, and uh, well, in this case, you know, this maze, that's going to work. OK, um, but if I reset it and it happens to be going down, then poor Snowbot's going to plunge off into the lava. So instead, after he goes right, we would like to um, say, OK, well, if you can go right, then go right. Otherwise, go down. Uh, and so sure enough, there is a there is a tile for this. So if I grab the if else tile. Um, so I can go, uh, well, if, what do I want to ask? As you see these brackets, what, what do I want to ask? I want to ask if I can go right. Uh, so if I can go right, we can see that can go right. It's another function call. So it's got the name of it and these parentheses afterwards to call the function. Only in this case, it's going to give me the yes or no of can I go right or not? Well, the true or false of whether I can go right or not. And then I'd like, if I can, I'd go right. And if I can't, I want to go down. Uh, and I want to do that after going right once. So let's drop that in there. Let's reset it. And now, well, it does the right thing and it succeeds. And if I reset it, it's going down instead. Well, it still does the, does the right thing and it succeeds. Um, let's pop over into, uh, into text mode and so see what I can type that in. So you'll see that if I'm saying if, can go right uh, and you'll notice so well I could have this problem that I could miss out those um, those curly braces uh, sorry the parentheses um, let's just show you what happens uh, if, if that happens uh, so I'm going to reset it and if I run this hang on he plunged off into the lava he did the wrong thing What's happened there? Well, the problem is that I didn't uh, call this function can go right. I just referred to it. And if I go if function can go right, well, there is a function can go right. All right. Uh, go right. Um, so uh, we'll meet that a little bit more detail when we talk about types uh, in another video. Uh, but so my bug there was I'd missed these parentheses so that I was calling can go right to ask if Snowbot could go right rather than uh, just referring to the function. Uh, and so if I do it that way, that should now work. Um, oh, sorry. And I, the here we go. So I missed out the else statement. So if he can't go right, I'd like him to go down. 
so we can say if can go right go right and we don't have to have an else statement but we can uh, and so this time let's reset so it's like that this time because he can't go right he should go down so far so good um, lots of mistakes that I could make I could uh, instead unmatched curly braces um, I could uh, instead, I could accidentally have misspelt that ELE, Ooh, what's going on there. Um, so it, it's quite easy to, um, if I did that, I would sort of suddenly get another syntax error here. And it was gonna, this one's got a slightly unhelpful uh, error message. It's, it's saying unexpected token semicolon. Um, but, uh, well, actually, the problem is that I've got an extra close parentheses. I haven't matched them. So sometimes the error messages that we're going to get from the uh, interpreter, if it can't parse our code, um, you're going to need to think about them and find the particular bug. Uh, so that is partly why I've got the um, the, the, the tiled spaced way uh, that will help you with some of, uh, some of that. Uh, it's not totally foolproofed. Um, incidentally, if you've got it in text mode, you can also go, let's go click the if else button and it will drop in kind of a skeleton if else, but you'll see that it's not quite filled it all in. Uh, so here we need, we need to put in the can go right. Um, okay, and then we're back back to where it were. Uh, right, other common bugs that I can show you. Uh, so in JavaScript, uh, it's what's called a curly brace language. And so blocks of code go into these curly braces. So I could pop in here and I could say, let me go print learn, I can't go right. And print learn is another little function I've designed, uh, defined in the environment that is going to print to this text area down here. So let's now reset that and let's get one, well that time you can go right, so let's get it so that it's going down like that. And so he trundles along and he prints learn out, I can't go right, and then he disappears, and you'll see it complete, uh, this completed with undefined me method that just means that our program here has finished executing. Um, now, why am I mentioning that? Well, these curly braces, they define what's called a block of code, things that are going to get executed in sequence. Technically, I don't have to use the curly braces on my if. So here I've just dropped the curly braces off that bit with the going right and that still works. Um, but it can produce a kind of trivial in the program but hard to find subtle bug if you don't use your curly braces. So if I deleted my curly braces off here and I now run this program, what do you think might happen? Um, uh, so here we go. It's going right. Otherwise, uh, print learn can't go right and then go down. Uh, let's just, uh, let's just run this one. And so in that case, he goes right, but whoa, he didn't stop. Suddenly he plunged off into the lava. What, what was going on there? He, he went right. Uh, then he could go right, and so he went right, but what made him go down? What made Snowbot go plunging off into the lava? And so the, the problem is that as we read this, it looks as though these both belong to the else statement. And there are languages like that where they would, the languages like Python that use indentation uh, to group their blocks of code. JavaScript isn't one of these. Um, JavaScript is a curly brace language um, that... Uh, doesn't use indentation to separate it. So what we'd actually got was like this, or let's just shrink it down onto one line to make it a little bit more readable what might be going on. Uh, so it's gone... Uh, oh, no, maybe I need to keep those on separate lines for, for it to be happy. Uh, so what we've said is go right, then if you can go go right, Otherwise, print then I can't go right. But whatever you're doing, after that if or after that else, the next thing we're doing is going down. And so that was why it went right. It went right, uh, but then it went down at the end and plunged off into the lava instead of uh, uh, instead of going through the, um, going and teleporting away. 
Uh, whereas if I put the curly braces in, and okay, I've not sorted my indentation out, and so this is now not very readable, um, it would do the right thing. It would stop there and teleport away. So programmers often adopt coding conventions to make it less likely that they will hit these sorts of bugs that people just know, oh, I'm going to read that and I'm going to miss that that's a bug and I'm going to spend all day hunting for my error and it's just because the indentation made me think it was something slightly different than it was. And so one of those con coding conventions might well be uh, that if you're doing if else statements, always use the curly braces. Another one is that then you'd also like to line up the um, uh, line up the code with nice indentations so that it's neatly readable. Uh, and so that now is back to what we wanted. And there we go. It succeeds. OK, I've spent long enough on that one. Let's keep going. Let's keep going. So notes from this. Simple solution might be this. Uh, a few things to, to note. Blocks of code marked by these curly braces, curly brace, brace language, whereas some other languages like Python use indentation. Um, oh, can go right returns a Boolean result. True or false? Let's just pop back and do that. Um, so let's reset it and let's just show what it starts right at the beginning. So um, I said can go right. What would that produce? Let's just print out the result of can go right with its uh, curly braces. So here he is, and it should always be true that he can go right. Uh, and so there we go. It prints out true. And so this is a Boolean value, a true or false value. Uh, whereas, for instance, if I was to miss out the, um, uh, the bracket and I just told it to print the function, uh, well, what would it do? It would, uh, in this in this case, sorry, that, that is a particular thing to do with uh, how my code environment uh, works and how it's communicating to where it's really running the code. Um, that it, 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 it doesn't manage to do that, so we get a curious error. Uh, but so you might see curious errors come up like that. It's not a very helpful error message. In this case, the error message is actually, sorry, the error is actually I didn't put the parentheses in. Uh, okay, let's keep moving on. Uh, so syntax and if statement, don't forget to put the condition you're checking inside uh, brackets. Uh, so if I was to say if true, uh, right, uh, then you'll see that I'm getting a little red X up here. It, it, it's, it wants those parentheses around the condition uh, for the if. Uh, and it doesn't have, an else, have to have an else clause, but it can have an else clause. Let's keep going. Uh, so that was in notes uh, my thing about uh, what happens if you don't use the curly braces. Uh, let's move on to a slightly bigger maze. Let's move on from ifs. Uh, now, this one here is going to go right, 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 down, down, down. This is going to get a little bit long. If I was just to write this like so... I'm going to end up with what we call spaghetti code. It's long, it's unreadable, uh, it's hard to tell if I've got the right number of writes versus down in them because I have to stare at the code menu. One, two, three, four. I don't think I do. One, two, no, he's going to plunge off into the lava, isn't he? Um, and so that's a slightly awkward way of doing coding. What if we could say, well, look, while you can go right, I want you to go right. Um, so let's do that. Let's uh, let's clear that text and let's grab a while statement. So uh, over here in the uh, this one here, while and again we want a condition. Uh, while what's the case? While what's the case? Well, in this case, I want it to be the case of while I can go right. So let's call my can go right function. And what do I want to do while I can go right? Well, I'd like to go right, please. Okay, so let's run that. And now he's going to go heading right, and he should stop here because, um, well, then the condition becomes false, and so it exits the loop. So what while loops do is each time around they check whether this thing here is true or not, and if it is, they do the loop, and they come back and do their check again, uh, and if it's not, they exit the loop and keep on going. Um, and so if we have a look, you should see that the completed will undefined only appears just after he's got here. That's when it exits the loop, and that's then when the program finishes, because that's all we've got, uh, all we're doing. So then if I want to get him all the way down to the goal, well, I ought to ask um, then, while you can go down, I'd like you to go down.
Okay, and let's reset that and let's run it. And so now while you can go right, you can go right. And then it will go on to our second while loop. And while it can go down, it can go down. It should stop at the end because it can't go uh, you can't go down into the lava. And there we go. He teleports out and it completes. Um, <coughs> so far, so good. Let me look at my crib notes, what else I wanted to uh, tell you. So a while loop performs its check at the start of each loop. If the check is true, the body executes. If it is false, it doesn't. Um, and so if I go here, I could, if I wanted, go print learn can go right. And so in this case, we should see him um, go all the way to the right and then we'll see false appear down here. There we go, false. And so you went as far right as you could and then false and then the um, um, there was nothing after that and so the program finished. Okay. Now, previously we assumed the maze always goes right first. But what if we've got a maze like this one that... There we go. Sometimes it goes down first. So in this case, I would have this problem that if I said... Uh, whoops, sorry. If I said while can go right, go right, and then while can go down, go down. Well, the first thing we'll, we'll notice is that he doesn't go right at all because the first time through it does this check and he can't go right. So, nope, done that bit. Instead, we're going to move on to looking at the down phase. Uh, let, let's print learn now trying to go down to see when that happens. Uh, and then he's going to go, while well, he can go down, he can go down and he'll get here and then it'll stop and it'll finish. OK, so let's see that happen. So straight away, now trying to go down and goes down, the program finishes. So he didn't get there. So he didn't get there. So instead, what if we were to do something that we can kind of always do. So let us clear that and let's clear my code here. And what if I was to say, so I want to do something in a check. W what is always true? Well, true is always true. Uh, so this is like saying forever, while true, because every time it'll come around and it'll do its check, it'll get the answer true. And so that's what it'll do. And so now what I'd like it to do is say, look, if you can go right, then I would like you to go right. Else, if you can go down, then I would like you to go down. And I've missed a couple of semicolons. Probably doesn't matter. It could infer those, but let's just put them in for the moment. So now if I reset that, well, if you can go right, it goes right. If it can go down, it can go down. And that's always the case. And you'll see him teleport away. But you'll notice it never printed out completed over here. Because actually our program is still running. So this is still looping around, asking itself. Because it said, you know, forever, while true. If you can go right, go right. Otherwise, if you can go down, go down. Um, so this is what we call an infinite loop. And uh, it just doesn't appear to do anything because a snowbot who's teleported away can't go right or down. So um, so it, it, it's not happening. But we can see that the program has not exited. Uh, so this is an infinite loop. And there is a bit of a risk with uh, infinite loops. Uh, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to pop to... Um, sorry, let's just exit full screen and let's pop to um, a new tab. And oh, let's come through to the same um, to the same one uh, as we were doing before. Uh, and let's just open those developer tools. So it's going to pop back to the start again, isn't it? Never mind. Never mind. This over here, this is a JavaScript programming environment. So previously I did this console.log of hello. And it logged out hello. <coughs> I could write a loop in here. I could write while true and say so this is an infinite loop. And well, I could even forget to make it do anything. I could have an infinite empty loop. And so this is just going to keep going around and it's going to do its check 
going to be true, so it'll want to do the body of the code. And then it'll do its check, and it's true, so it'll want to do the body of the code. And then it'll do its check, and it's true, and it'll want to do the body of the code. And something quite awkward can happen in this case. So if I do that, OK, and now I'm just going to key through the... Hang on, I can't key through the slides. I can't... Hang on, let, let's type something here. OK, but if I hit enter, nothing happens. Everything's locked up. Um, so... There is a curiosity <clears throat> in most programming environments that most of the ones that have UIs are basically single threaded. Uh, so what that means is they're doing one thing at a time. They're either rendering the picture on the screen or they're running the little program that you've written. Now, in this case, it renders the picture on the screen. It goes to run the little program that I wrote it. But that little program that I wrote it doesn't terminate it just keeps going and going and going and so what's it, it's one thing it's doing is just rendering that little program uh sorry running that little program and so then it, it can't react to all of the other stuff that i would like it to do because it is still busy running this infinite loop uh, so these kinds of infinite loops they're they're a kind of bug that you can come across and in fact to get rid of this one i am going to have to close that tab entirely it'll take it a moment and then it should go away uh, because that will kill the process the the, the um the, the operating system process uh, that that uh, little program was running in okay so that is <clears throat> an infinite loop and kind of one of the dangers of infinite loops so normally uh, we would actually like our um, loops always to have a terminal case a condition that they're they're going to exit uh, in fact, this one, uh, I do some curious things to your program that you'll find out in later videos. Um, but that means that, uh, well, although this program is always running, um, actually we're able to do more than one thing at once. And I'm able to uh, reset and terminate uh, that program somewhat. Empty info loops can sometimes still cause it a problem. OK, let's keep going. So. This is a while loop, and the thing with while loops is they do their check before they run the block of code. And so that means that if the first time through this check is, was false, then it wouldn't run this block of code at all. Um, infinite loops are these ones that don't terminate, and occasionally you can do things like hang your browser with an infinite loop. Uh, so infinite loops are ones to be a little bit careful of. Um, next, what I'm going to do is I'm going to go back to this version of the code. Let's go right while we can go right, and then let's go down while we can go down. So I'm just going to copy that code off the slide. And you'll see here that I have got a little maze that if we go right while we can go right, we're going to land up in a dead end over here. All right. So let's flip this over into text mode, and let's paste that code in. Uh, let's just check that it goes and ends up in the dead end. And then we should see the program finish down here with Snowbot stuck in his dead end. Sure enough, it did. <coughs> now, let's clear the console and let's uh, and let's reset that. Let's change this from a while loop to a do while loop. So I'm going to take that bit of code there. And I'm going to remove it and I'm going to go do right while can go right. Then I'm going to go do down while can go down. Now, if you look at this, you can kind of see that the check now is at the end of the block of code in the loop. And so sure enough, this is what's going to happen. This do loop uh, is going to run the block once and then it's going to check whether it should run it again. And if it should, it'll run the block again and then it'll check if it should run it again and keep going until it's false. But it means it will always run it at least once. And so this means that we are going to end up, uh, well, he's going to go right while he can go right, and then he'll stop going right. But then, whoa, he plunges off down into the lava because as soon as it goes on to the next bit, it says do down, and it goes down once before it even does the check. So this is a difference between while loops and do while loops, that do while loops always run the block at least once, and they do their check as to whether they should repeat it at the end. Um, OK, so check is made at the end of the block. Block will always execute at least once. For this one, so how are we going to do this? Because I don't really want to go back into that awkwardness of having to write right the exact number of times. Let's instead 
try and count the number of times that we've gone right. Because we want to go right one, two, three, four, five times. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to first of all declare a variable. So let, um, well, this is just a, an index into a counter of how many times we've gone. So let's just call the variable i. And let's say that I want i to be the number zero. So let is how we declare a variable. And it's called a variable because it can change. If I call it's instead set of const, a constant can't change. Const i is zero, i is zero. I can't modify it. But a variable is something that I can modify. Now, what I'd like to say is, well, I want to go uh, five times. So what I'm going to say is I'm going to say while that variable is less than five, what I would like you to do is I would like you to go right. But then I would like you to make I I plus one. Now, instantly, some people who are new to programming will look at that and go, what's going on here? I is zero. Zero equals zero plus one. No, zero doesn't equal one. And so this is one of the things that's a little confusing in some, lang some languages, that a single equal sign in a language like JavaScript is used to mean assignment, not to mean equality. So when I say I equals I plus one, I am saying set I... Uh, the, the, the the variable we'd already declared called i, assign the value to it, the current value of i plus 1. So it goes 0 plus 1, OK, that's 1. So now I'm assigning the value 1 into i. Um, let's also, actually, what, let's print len of i in here. And it uh, goes right and then increments i. And so let's clean up the console and let's run that. And we should see 0, 1, 2, 3, 4. Completely with under 5. So notice we didn't get 5. Because it comes around when i is 5, it comes around, it does its check, and 5 is not less than 5. 5 is equal to 5. So this is false. Um, if I wanted, I could print learn at the end i was and print out i, uh, we should see that at the end it came through as 5 because i is i plus 1 will have happened. So it will have gone from 4 to 5. The check will have been false. It will go on to the next statement. I should expect to see that say, uh, say 5 at the end. Um, let's run it. 0, 1, 2, 3, 4. And at the end, i was 5. OK. So that is a little way that we can count how far we've gone. And of course, that's sort of useful in all sorts of ways, one of which is that if I wanted to change how far we've gone, I don't have to go and edit and count the number of uh, rights. I can just go change this number here and now it'll only go um, it'll only go three. Um, and so here we go. Zero, one, two. At the end, I was three. Um, the other thing you'll notice is that programmers often start counting from zero rather than counting from one. Um, that's going to become important when we're talking about index, uh, sorry, indexes into arrays, a particular type next week. Often uh, we number things from zero as they go from zero up uh, exclusively to the number that we're looking for. So we end up with an i is less than three. So in these numbers that it was doing in the loop, i, it, I was zero, one or two. It didn't actually go through the loop with i being three. Um, OK, so. Quite a lot going on here. Let declares a local variable. In scope for the rest of the block it's in, because it's a variable, its value can be updated. If I change this to const i is zero, I am going to get a problem. Uh, I am going to get it go zero, type error, assign to a constant variable. You said i was a constant, and now you've just tried to update it. N uh not doing that. That's a type error. Um, Programmers often start counting from zero from uh, one. Equals in JavaScript is assignment, not equality. It updates the variable's value. Uh, we'll see equality next week. Um, generally speaking, uh, well, let's, let's show it to you for the moment. Um, let's go i is zero. If I was just to go print learn and ask the question, is i equal to zero, um, then 
that should print out true. So double equals is one of the kinds of equality check, whereas a single equals is assignment. It gets a bit more complicated because there's also triple equals in JavaScript. Um, but a particular thing to do with JavaScript that we will see next week. Um, uh, or, well, the next video, whenever, whenever you watch that. Um, OK, so uh, other things to mention. Well, when I said i equals i plus one, there's a couple of other ways I could have done that. So let's uh, let's go back to our um, our version. Let's copy it off the slide so that I can paste it in. Copy, pop back. Here we go. This line here, there's a shorthand for this. Instead of saying i equals i plus one, because that sort of thing, something you write quite often, there's a shorthand. I can say i plus equals one, and that means i equals i plus one. Uh, so that should still work. Um, there is also, if I go i++, that means increment i. So that means specifically, I would like you to add 1 to i. Um, and it's a common enough operation that it has a, a special notation, i++. And so that one will also still work. All right, let's keep going. C style for loops. This here is a pretty common pattern. It's very common for us to say we want to start at zero. We want to go up to less than some number and we want to do something. Uh, but it's kind of easy to make a mistake, especially if we had a long bit of code. So if I was, um, let's put a comment in. So comments, I can do two slashes just to put it in whatever text. So comments is just if I want to put a note to myself, but the compiler should ignore it. Um, or I can put in a... Um, multi-line comment by starting one with forward slash asterisk and ending it closing slash asterisk and I could uh, talk about what I'm doing in here and maybe I would be printing out what I is and this could start to get a little bit longer and it might be easy for me to forget to increment I at the end and so now I'm doing my loop and just because these things are starting to get a bit spread apart I've not noticed, but in my loop, i is always zero and he's plunging off into the lava because that is now an infinite loop and it's not going to finish um, because I forgot to put my increment condition in, ended up with a, a loop that won't terminate. Um, so to make it perhaps less likely that you're going to make those kinds of mistake, um, there is another notation for this. Instead of writing that, I could say for let i equals zero. So my loop initializer at the beginning, that's my initial thing that I was doing before the loop. Uh, I'm then going to put in a semicolon followed by the check that I want to make. And the check that I want to make is i is less than five. So that is the check that's going to happen at the start before each loop occurs because it's like a while loop so it ha the check happens before the block executes and then what would I like to do at the end of every loop before I do the check again well I would like to increment i um, and then I'm going to put my block and I'm just going to say in my block what I want it to do uh, in that block uh, so this is a different syntax for something very similar uh, but in this syntax uh, my loop initialization, the condition at the start of my loop, and the action I want to do at the end of each loop, uh, all that machinery is put up here into one line. So I'm less likely to, to forget part of it, make a mistake with it. And it's also separated it so that I can more clearly see, and this is what I want to do inside the block. Uh, and so that should now uh, happily go to the right. Um, and so we should see again, zero, one, two, three, four, completed with undefined. OK, so that is um, it's what's called C style for loops because they were introduced in the programming language C. They also exist in Java. Um, they're in JavaScript. Um, some languages, not all languages, um, languages like Python that are quite different from C uh, might not have them. Now, let us um, for this one, I just want to show you a difference to do with the scope, depending on whether you do this format. Uh, or the C style for loop, because this is going to let me introduce variable scopes. So if I paste this in and I say let i equals zero, while i is less than five, print out i, increment it, exit the loop, 
um and at the uh, well let's just go print learn at the end of the loop uh and let's put i at the end and so that prints out zero one two three four at the end of the loop five now let's do it instead using this version so let's just delete that bit of code and paste in our for loop that does the same sort of thing. So for let i or zero, i is less than five, i plus plus, print i. At the end of the loop, in i, let's clear that, reset and run it. And we go zero, one, two, three, four, reference error, i is not defined. So variables, names generally in, in, in programming language have scopes. And so in this case, I have declared this variable i in the initializer of this for loop and its scope goes to the end of the body of the for loop. So that is, if you like, where that variable exists. Afterwards, if you go outside that scope, it's like that name has been forgotten. It goes, I, what are you talking about, I? There is no I. I is not defined because it's no longer in scope. Uh, in, this partic in this case, when I was uh, declaring it, uh, oops, Sorry, I'm having trouble selecting text reliably. There we go. Uh, if I paste that in, I've declared the variable outside the loop. So this variable here, its scope will now go to the end of the block of code it's in. And well, it's not inside this block, uh, the, the, the while block, it's inside this whole block out here. And so that is now still in scope at the end of this loop here. Um, so one of the things that that might mean is suppose I wanted to do this loop twice. Let's take that code and let's copy it. Let i equals zero while it is i was i plus one. Let i equals zero. Um, well, in that case, when I do the let trying to declare a new variable, it's going to complain that it's already been declared. Syntax er error. Identifier i has already been declared. I can't declare a new name i because there really is a name i in this scope. Uh, whereas if I was to do it using the for loop, well, this i here, its scope runs to the end of there and then it's out of scope. So when I do this one, it's not colliding um, with, with the same uh, name. And so that one should now go 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 0, 1, 2, 3, 4. Uh, so that is a little bit to start introducing things about variable scopes. Um, now, if we can give a variable, an, a number, a name, what if we could give an action, a name? So we have said that we would like um, to uh, go write five times. That sounds like a, a nice reusable bit of code. I would like to give a name to that bit of code. I would like to be able to call that the action write five. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to declare a function. So I say function and its function name is going to be write five and is going to take no arguments. There's nothing between the brackets, no arguments coming into this function. And what you're going to do is whenever you see write five, I want you to do for, for let i equals zero, i is less than five, i plus plus, go write. So let's copy that bit of code. And I think I've got another environment. Yep, I've got the same one on the, on the next slide over here. And let's paste this in. Uh, incidentally, there is a little widget down here for, so if I was to go into my tiles, sorry, I could say, look, I would like a function called write five. Uh, and that's the name of the function. And I'd like to declare it. And so I get function write five. And if I wanted to call that function, well, it looks a bit like calling other functions. Um, write five, parent, empty parentheses, because it takes no arguments. Um, so I, ca I, I can do this in the tiles, but I, I, I like showing it in text for the moment. So let's keep showing it in text. Uh, so now, if I declare that as a function, well, let's declare it, but not call it. If I declare it, but don't call it, it goes, all right, you designed a function, exited. I haven't actually done any going right. But now I could say, go write five for me, please. And this would call the function that I just uh, declared. There it goes. One, two, three, four, five. Done. Okay. Now, 
that, uh, well, we said go write five, but I don't really want to have to write write five, write four, write three, write two, write one. Uh, what if we could say I want you to go write some number n times? And so sure enough, I can do that. Let's say instead of calling it write five and taking no arguments, let's take the argument n. So now when I call write five, I want to give it a number of how far right I want it to go. And so then in my loop here, instead of checking if i is less than five, I'm going to check if i is less than n. Uh, so I should probably rename this, shouldn't I? I should rename that something like, um, let's just rename it go right and get it to take a, 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 a an argument. And uh, so now if I was to run that, I've got a mistake over here because of course I'm, I'm calling something that's not been defaulted defined. Uh, so write five is not defined. Of course it's in. So I've, I've renamed it to go write. So now let's just tell it go write five. And so that's going to call this function with the argument n is going to have the value five. And so it should do, uh, well, let's make it printed out as well. So let's print out, print learn <coughs> of i inside the loop. And so we should see it go zero, one, two, three, four again. Uh, let's run that. Zero, one, two, three, four. Completed. And if I wanted to refer to n, well, I could, if I wanted, I go print learn. I was called with, and let's put n, what the number is at the beginning. And let's go and run that. I was called with five. So n is five, and that's where it goes. Zero, one, two, three, four, and finishes. Uh, but now I could, if I wanted, say, I just want you to go right twice. I was called with two, zero, one, stopped. So now I've got a reusable bit of parameterized functionality that we call a function. Okay, uh, so if I wanted, there is another notation that I could use. Uh, this is the one that we have used. We've used the keyword function to declare a variable. Uh, if I wanted, I could actually say, look, I would like this, uh, I would like to let the variable go right be the function to go right. So there's a couple of different ways I can do this. So if I instead, let's take that out and let's put this funny little arrow um, that uh, helps denote a function. And let's say, let's, let's go, let go right equals that. And so this is now what's called an arrow function. Uh, but it should behave in exactly the same way. It's just a different notation for declaring a function. And so called with two is one, two. Uh, and in fact, I could, if I wanted, say let go right equal function of n. So this is just yet another different bit of syntax for doing the same thing. JavaScript has a few different ways that you can declare functions, um, but they behave very, very similarly. OK, so that's just different notations for declaring a function. Um, next thing to say, uh, what if uh, we were to reuse, a, we, we had a variable out here uh, called age, and um, if we pass it in and we change this argument, will it affect the one outside it? And the answer is no, because and the reason is because uh, JavaScript is what's called a pass by value uh, language. So if I uh, paste that in, and so I've said, I want to declare a variable called age, which is going to be 21. And now I want to have a function called get older, which is going to take a parameter, an argument, age inside the function, and I'm going to say, well, now I'm going to update that parameter so the age in function is now twice whatever you passed in, and I'm going to print it out. And the question I've got is, does that affect this variable? And so we're going to say, let age is 21. We're going to declare the function. We're going to call the function get older, passing that age variable. And then we're going to print, but outside the function you are, and print this this variable age again to see whether or not it's been affected. And the answer is no, it is not affected. Um, now you're 42, but outside the function after we've done the call, you're 21. So when we did uh, age in function is age in function times two, we altered this 
uh, argument, we didn't alter whatever variable was passed as the argument. Instead, it took the value from that variable and passed the value from that variable into our function argument. Uh, and so then it doubled the value inside the function argument, but the variable still keeps its old value. Um, now, let's do something else. So this is a little bit more on scopes and shadowing. Uh, in this example, I had the name here was age, and the name here was age in function. Uh, what if instead I reuse the name? Does it affect it then? So this is now function that takes a parameter called age. And now I've said age is age times two. And I've said now you are age, get order of age, but outside the function you are age. So you can kind of see that there, there is this complexity here that we've got a variable whose scope is all the way through here. And then we've got a an argument in here inside uh, this function, uh, so inside a contained scope that has the same name, and we're allowed to do that. So let, let, let's let's run this, and it still behaves the same way. So it says, um, I call the function, and it says, now you are 42, because it has doubled this function argument, uh, but outside the function you are 20, uh, you are 21. Uh, so this is this complexity that's called, it, it's called shadowing. Uh, although these have the same name, they are not the same. This is a function argument called age that has this scope. This is a variable that has this scope. When I'm referring to the name age inside the function, I'm referring to the one in the narrower scope. Um, now, it is possible to make mistakes because of this, because suppose I was accidentally to call that function argument mage. Now what I've got is I've got a variable called age whose scope is all the way through the program, and I've got a function argument called mage whose scope is in here. Uh, but in here, I'm now referring to age, which is, well, it's only this one, because the function argument has a different name. And so if I was to run that, now it would say, now you are 42, but outside the function, you are 42. So inside this function scope, we can still refer to things outside it. Uh, it's just that when we called the argument same name, this name here for this argument inside the function scope, it shadowed, it obscured um, this one. We couldn't refer to the age outside because the, that name was used by something in a narrower scope. Um, OK, you, that, that, that might sound a little bit subtle, but uh, hopefully you'll, you'll, you'll get used to that uh, as you do lots more programming and, and see these come up in real programs. Let's keep going. Uh, so that was scopes and shadowing. Now, next thing, let's talk about return values. When I said println can go right, it printed out true. I called a function and I got a value back, the value true. And I could print it out. What about if I print learn right? What value comes back from that? Well, if I try it, let's uh, tell it. So it's going to go right. Whatever value comes back from that function is going to pr get printed out. So I go right, and then I get this special value called undefined. So because this function doesn't return anything, what it actually does is it returns the value undefined. Um, how could we write a function that will tell us uh, if we can do both? So let's try and write a function that can actually return a value, um, because all of these previous ones that we've been doing, um, they've just been doing stuff. Um, they've been going right. They've been going down. They haven't been returning values that we could use in an if. Uh, so this time, let us ask ourselves, uh, how can we define a function that says whether we can go right or we can go down? So I'm going to say function um, can go both. And so what I'm going to say uh, is I'm going to say that this should return the result of can go right or this funny little double bar thing with the result of can go down. And so now I'm just going to print learn 
can go both. And so I should get true because if I reset it, so you can go right, you can go down. So can go right or can go down. Uh, so this is uh, inclusive or uh, true or true is true. Um, so this should end up printing out true and it does. Now, if I wanted to do an exclusive or if I wanted to print out, can you go right uh, but not go down or can you go down but not go right? Uh, then, well, I could use the not equals operator. So just as two equals is shows equality in JavaScript, if I want to say something's not equal to something, I can use exclamation mark equals. And so now this um, uh, this one, I guess we should rename it one but not the other. And so can go one but not the other uh, should now pr produce false because it can go both. Uh, and so this should be true, which is equal to true. It's not not equal to true. Uh, and so sure enough, it does. It prints out false. Um, <coughs> easy mistakes you can make. Uh, some languages, you don't have to use the return keyword. Uh, so if I was to miss out that return keyword, uh, and let's clear that, and let's print out can go one but not the other. I mean, it looks, you know, OK, yep, can go right. It's not equal to can go down. And let's run it. And I get undefined. And that's because, well, we told it to evaluate this statement, but we haven't told it to return it. And so it hasn't. Um, so instead, let us say return can go right is not equal to uh, can go down uh, so that we get our true or false returned. Um, just another of those little easy mistakes that we could make. Uh, OK. So things that we can say, oh, OK, let's uh, so can go both. Uh, sorry, of course, uh, can go both. There I was talking to the video and I was getting my logic wrong. I asked if it could do one or the other. But what I want to know is if it can do both of them. And that's not or, that's and. And so double ampersand is a Boolean and. So in that case, true and true uh, will return true, but true and false would return false. Uh, so let's now see if we can go both. And uh, we're about to see that I've got an error. G can go both is not defined. Why? Well, I've made a tape typo up here when I was defining my uh, function name. So now if I say can go both is can go right and can go down, print then, and now it comes out true. Yes, I, I, I can now uh, go both right uh, and I can go down. Some other operators, I'm not going to give you the full list because there's actually there's lots of reference documentations around that you can go to. Uh, so let's open that in a new tab. And so that is the uh, this is uh, MDN, uh, MDN Web Docs. And so these are very, very useful references for JavaScript. OK, this one's a little long to show you in the first video, uh, but it shows you, for instance, this is what the less than operator looks like. This is what the greater than lo operator looks like. This is what the less than or equal operator looks like. And this is what the greater than or equal operator looks like. And it even has this note to say, look, you've got to do the le the greater than before the equals because equals greater than is, is not that operator. It's that notation for arrow function that I showed you just before. Um, OK, sorry, let's uh, skip back to where I was. And sorry about my slide resetting again. That is a little bit awkward in the video, isn't it? Um, so that was in terms of returning, da uh, returning data. But so a few of the operators, less than or equals, uh, is a less than or equal to B. Uh, if I would like to do, um, you know, this condition here returns true, and I want to check that this one over here is the same. So that's is a less than or equal to b, and b is equal to c. Uh, this double pipe is an is a a boolean or operator, and you should notice that it is inclusive or. So true or true is true. Uh, but if you want to do um, exclusive or, and you've got booleans true or falses, then one of the things you can ask is well, if they're not equal to each other, and you'll effectively get an exclusive or. So true, false will give you true, false, true will give you true, but false, false will give you false, and uh, true and true would give you false uh, if you uh, do the, the not equals. Now, another thing to say is that uh, arguments to these functions that we're defining, uh, well, technically they're optional. So let us define a function, go down and right, and we're going to give it two arguments. 
how far to go down and then how far to go right. And then we're just going to pass it one value. So I'm going to say I would like a function go down and right. And I would like to say how far I want to go down and how far I want to go right. And so you see I've got a comma separating my argument, uh, separating my arguments. And so then what I'm going to do is I'm going to do my little for loop for let i equals zero, um, i is less than d i plus plus, and I want to go down, and then for loop, well, let's copy and paste this. Uh, it doesn't matter if I reuse the i because it'll be in a different scope because it's in a, you know, it gets its own scope inside that, uh, inside that for loop. Uh, so it's not the same i as this one. And so now I'd like to go right, but I've got to remember that now I want to check the second parameter. So now if I was to call this, I should be able to say go down and right. And I should say that I want to go down one, two, three, four, five. And then I want to go right. So R, I'm going to go one, two, three, four, five. So if I go down and write five, I should reach the exit. Two, three, four, and then hitting this way. And so it should reach the end and should teleport away. Done. OK, solved, solved the little puzzle. Uh, but the question I've actually got is what happens if I don't say go down right 5 comma 5? What happens if I only pass one of those? So up here, I'm going to go print learn d was, and let's print out what d was, and print learn r was, and let's print out what r was inside the function. Um, so now when I go down and right, what I should see is I should see that 5 goes into the first value, but what goes into r? And so it says d was 5 and r was undefined. So I've still been able to call the function, but now r has this special value undefined. It's not a number, it's just the value undefined. Um, so if I wanted, <coughs> I could actually des design this function to um, uh, basically to, to cater for that. I could say if d is not undefined, um, then what I would like to do is go down. And then if r is not equal to undefined, then I would like to go right. And this is actually done quite commonly in JavaScript libraries. It is quite common for uh, people writing toolkits to um, basically put optional parameters at the end. And so if you don't want to use them, just don't pass them. And in the body of their code, it will check whether the parameter was undefined, in which case it'll know to give it some default value or whatever it wants to do with it. Uh, now, I've actually got, uh, and so this will come up next time, I've actually got this little note to say that I should be using this version of not equals, exclamation mark, two equal signs to say not equal to undefined when I'm comparing it. Uh, we'll see why that's the case uh, in kind of the next video, because that has all to do with uh, what's called JavaScript's type system. Um, but in the meantime... Uh, so the notes for this function go down and right of d comma r if d is not and I should change that I'll I'll, I'll change that in in the slides when I post them to to have the double equals and I'll change this one to have the double equals that it should have if we only call it with an ar one argument and uh, we'll go down five squares uh, we gave the first argument d the value five but because we didn't pass the second argument it's going to get left the value undefined okay. That is what I wanted to show you just to introduce some of the basic syntax of JavaScript. Uh, I realize it's probably been quite a long video, uh, but uh, I wanted to show you quite a few quirks, in including some common errors that you can, um, can come across and might throw you the first time you come across them. Um, the Lava Maze and its other characters will return so you can practice some more interesting things uh, during exercises uh, later on. Uh, but for the first environment, I'm actually going to give you something uh, in, in in the first tutorial, I'm going to give you something a lot more traditional, which is called turtle graphics. And so um, this here, uh, we've no longer got a, got a maze. We've got like a sheet of graph paper and we've got a little thing in the middle that's called a turtle. Uh, I know this one doesn't look like a turtle. I just, you know, that's what, what I picked to draw this particular one like. 
but in this case, we have um, different commands that we can give it. We can ask it to go forwards and we can ask it to go forwards by some particular distance. Let me grab a number input field and drop that into the box. And so let's ask it to go forwards 100. And if I ask it to go forwards 100, well, let's see what happens. It goes forward and you'll see it's like left a trail of pen behind because it's got this, this pen attached that can be up or down and we can set it to different colours uh, so that it can do different things. And uh, so let's get it to go that direction. Uh, let's get it then to turn left some number of degrees. Um, so let me put another uh, input field in. And should we go left? Let's go left 90 degrees. Uh, let's get it to lift its pen up so that it doesn't leave anything on the page. And uh, let's get it to go forwards uh, another. Um, uh, how far should we get this one to go forwards? Should we get this one to go forwards uh, 50? Uh, and then let's get it to turn left uh, another uh, 90 degrees. Let's change its colour. Let's go set colour. And I'm going to give this one the colour. Uh, so for colours, it takes um, it takes a string, which is uh, it's interpreted as a as a CSS colour. But I, so some of the ones I can give it have names like uh, let's uh, set this one to be red. Uh, and then let us set it to go forwards, uh, say, another, um, uh, let's get it to go forwards another 50 pixels. Uh, so if I run that, uh, reset and run, you should see it go forwards, turn left, uh, go right. Oh, I forgot to get it to put the pen down. So it did its turning, turning left up here and it did its going forwards, but I hadn't put the pen down, so it didn't leave any ink behind. Uh, so let me just go and slot in. Um, where do I want to put it? After it, just after it's turned left, set color red, put the pen back down again, and let's run it. And so now that uh, ooh, except it doesn't have a color to start with, so I want to start off. Um, there we go. Turns left, and uh, so it's drawn that, gone left with the pen up, turned red, and put the pen down. Uh, we can do the same thing, of course, over in our text environment. Uh, so let's reset that. Let's go forward 100, um, left 90 degrees. Uh, no, let's just go left 125 degrees. And let us set the co uh, sorry set color. And this time, let's give it a hash followed by an RGB value. Um, let's um, pick. Uh, what, what colour should we pick? Should we pick something that looks a little bit orange? So that's going to be a bit of red. So this is a hexadecimal number up to 255. Uh, a bit of yellow and not very much green. And so this, this this funny kind of thing here is a hexadecimal way of picking uh, a, a, a colour and then let us tell it to go forward um, another 150 pixels. And so let's run that. And so... Uh, oh, that wasn't very orange. That was that was um, that was pretty yellow, wasn't it? I think I'd need. Sorry, I need to reduce the amount of green in it uh, to make it a bit more uh, a bit more orange. So let's go from F naught to A naught for the amount of green that we give it. So it's it's red, green. Uh, sorry, red, then green, and then blue in the uh, the hexadecimals of how much um, how much of each color ink to put in effectively. Well, each color light to put in. Uh, there we go. That looks a little bit more orange. Uh, so this is a very traditional uh, kind of environment for learning to program in. It's called Turtle Graphics. And you can draw interesting things and we'll set some exercises that use that environment. And then we'll come back to the, the lava maze to do some interesting puzzles. Uh, but in the meantime, thank you very much for watching.